All right, guys, welcome to another video. Today, we're gonna to be going over temperament testing. When you're gonna do a temperament test on a puppy, seven weeks of age is the ideal time. And the reason being, seven weeks is when they're just leaving the first socialization period. This is the period of time where they're learning how to be dogs, they're learning communication skills from their litter mates and their mom. And then right about eight weeks of age is when they find their new homes anyway. A lot of breeders will have their puppies until about seven weeks of age and then they have the owners take on from there. Now, some breeders will keep the dogs later. When I got rust, I had them at 16 weeks of age, and I've heard different breeders keep their puppies to about 13 weeks of age. Different reasons, of course. Some people want the first fear period to happen within the care of the breeder so that they don't have to risk the first fear period happening with the owner who may or may not know how to handle that, if that were to happen. But in general, most breeders are gonna give their puppies between the ages of seven to eight weeks of age, which is why it makes seven weeks of age the ideal time to have a temperament test done on a litter of puppies, because then you get to sort of see, okay, who is gonna go where. Now, a lot of times the breeder themselves they are able to select because the breeders are evaluating these puppies from the moment they're born. They get to see their personality. They get to watch them grow. They get to see them experiment and develop for those, for those six, seven weeks that the breeder has them. Uh, and then, then they decide which home is going to be the most suitable home for each individual. Now, that is definitely an ideal route to take if the breeder understands uh, sort of which puppy is going to excel in which home and that's perfectly fine. Uh, sometimes a temperament test can come in handy and a temperament test can add value to, the, to what the breeder already brings to the table if the temperament test is done by a person who understands temperament. If the temperament test is done by a person who understands how a temperament test is performed who understands the breed, who understands uh, the development of the dog. If the temperament test is performed by somebody who doesn't have a whole lot of experience, so in that case, you're better off with the breeder doing the selection versus being done through a temperament test. You know, the way the temperament test is done, it is done by a person who doesn't know the puppies. So if, if I'm gonna do a temperament test, I would not be the person taking care of the puppies. Uh, also, the temperament test would be done in a new environment to the puppies. The puppies would not see this environment until the day of the temperament test. Okay, this is the temperament test guideline that I use for puppies seven weeks of age. This temperament test template is something I've been using for several years. It's based on William Campbell's research and the um, the similarity between this and the Volhar puppy temperament test is, is pretty uh, pretty close as well. So I've used the Volhar puppy temperament test as well, which is slightly different. Um, you know, pretty much the same concepts, same things that we're looking for. So I'll go over it right now. So first, we do the recovery. You see on the very top line on the left, recovery means... We're going to put the puppy in a new environment, put him down, and we're going to see which of those six options the puppy chooses to perform. And the way it goes is you have one through six, one meaning the boldest, okay, the most confident, the boldest response that the dog could have. Three being about the sort of the social, the ideal response a dog could have and then six five or six these are the responses that imply that the puppy is either timid or potentially not timid but possibly even completely independent like does not care about you or or the exercise it just wants to do its own thing and the notes are for us to sort of put some light and some clarification into some of the responses because one through six, if you look at these responses, they're very black and white, some of them. You know, like uh, on, on one of the responses here, um, you know, the 
on six, for instance, on recovery, it says runs away and hides. Okay. So runs away and hides, or, you know, let's say the, the puppy just runs away and hides, but maybe there is something that, that happened during the temperament test. Maybe as you were putting the puppy down to evaluate the recovery, maybe there happened to be a very loud, unusually loud sound that kind of startled the dog a little bit. I could put a note on that that says, hey, you know, even though it was six for recovery, this is what happened. So that's where we want to make sure that the experience comes in and we can then assess this and go, okay, this is not that black and white. We need to know why the dog did that. And if you have enough sense, enough experience, you can definitely clarify these things. The next thing is play drive. So in play drive, we're basically just going to use some sort of toy it could be a ball and a rope it could be a rag on a flirt pole these puppies are working dog candidates so i used a burlap sack which is very commonly used for protection training in puppies social attraction is the next thing we're going to you know bubble up uh praise the puppy and see how they respond to that social interaction then we have following most puppies will follow you so we want to see how they're going to follow us, what kind of uh, intensity they're going to follow us with, or if they even follow us at all. Then there's retrieving. Uh, then there is dominant or submissive tendencies. Now, the dominant or submissive tendencies, we have to remember these are seven-week-old puppies. Okay, We're not saying these dogs are very dominant or very submissive or that, they're, that we're going to label them as dominant because the temperament test says so. These are just guidelines. So this sort of gives you an idea of what the tendency might be, um, but it's certainly not uh, an excuse or a permission to label the dog as dominant necessarily. Uh, it just tells us what the puppy chose to do and, and what implication that option has. Then there is social dominance. Again, we have to realize that these are seven we call puppies. They are learning a lot about social dominance in the litter in the first seven weeks, six weeks of their lives. So by the time we get to the temperament test, they're somewhat aware of social interactions. So again, it's not to um, you know, it's not to label the puppy dominant or 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 anything like that. So we have to take the the temperament test and the guidelines of the temperament test with a little bit of a grain of salt, but we also have to realize it just gives us general guidelines to assess the temperament of each individual. There is food drive. You know, there is the intensity of the dog taking the food or whether the dog even chooses to eat or not. So, you know, on food drive, the last thing says no interest. Well, this is where I could put my notes. No interest as in something else, was more interesting or no interest as in now maybe the 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 person the breeder could tell me oh you know they just got into a lot of food a moment ago and uh that might be why right and when i do the temperament test i don't have the breeder there with me it's just me i have a helper but the breeder the people who take care of the puppies we don't we don't mess with that and then we have focus focus means the um you know we make we put a little bit of an obstacle to the piece of food that the dog uh, just ate. So the dog ate a piece of food. Okay, the next test is we grab another piece of food, and we're going to put a little bit of an obstacle. So we're going to put a piece of Tupperware over the piece of food, and we want to see how committed this puppy is to taking that piece of food. So from here, we do then sound sensitivity. Sound sensitivity we have something loud. Uh, I've used metal food bowls. Uh, I've also used uh, shaker cans. Like uh, you could have a, a an aluminum bottle with some pennies or some pebbles in it. It could be like a jug of rocks. You're not shaking it necessarily. You're just dropping something. And, uh, and it says roughly about six feet away or so. If you're going to use a big cast iron pan, 
or a big, big food bowl, um, I would add a little bit of distance to that. Remember, this doesn't have to be black and white. Just because I'm doing sound sensitivity doesn't mean, and it says six feet as the guideline. Remember, this is a guideline. Doesn't mean I'm going to grab a big cast iron pan and go six feet away from that puppy and drop it. I just want to see how the puppy responds to a loud sound that they were not expecting. So if I'm going to use something pretty large because that's what I have available, I'm going to add way more than six feet. Uh, in this case, what I did with the temperament test, I did use an aluminum can with pebbles in it. It is kind of loud, so I did not you know, do it, you know, right at six feet, uh, but it was roughly within the 10 foot mark. So we want to see what the dog does. And then we have energy level, right? So with energy level, uh, this is throughout the entire test. What kind of energy level did the puppy give us? Did, did, did it give us a high energy level uh, or was it, you know, pretty low key, pretty lethargic? And these are things where, again, with any of these, I could add a note, you know. So it could be that maybe the puppies are not the puppies not feeling well, which to add a note there, if, if the puppies are not feeling well, if one of the puppies are not feeling well, you don't want to do the temperament test if the puppy is clearly not feeling well. If it's recovering from some sort of illness, you want to postpone the temperament test for that particular puppy. And now you put it all together. So if, if you get a lot of ones, it says the interpretation of that is, you know, dominant aggressive, easily provoked to bite, and the dog needs an experienced handler. And that is typically the case. I have seen a lot of puppies turn into mature adults. I've done a lot of temperament tests on very young puppies, seven weeks of age, and I've watched them mature into adults. And I can tell you, that that is pretty much the case. The one score, the the score of a lot of ones, it does imply boldness and confidence. Just definitely what we want if you're going to be serious about sport work or if you really want a, a good, powerful, confident working dog. But it can be a problem, okay? It definitely can be a problem if you're not experienced or if you are experienced but you choose to you know train a particular way that 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 does not coincide with working with a very powerful dog what i mean by that is purely positive training okay i hate to be that thorn on your side to imply this but it is not uncommon for very powerful dogs especially working dogs to not excel in purely positive homes even if that purely positive trainer is experienced so uh, these are dogs that are going to make your life a living hell. All right. Uh, then you have twos, which, again, is kind of implying somewhere up there. Um, and then threes are going to be your, your ones that are actually pretty, you know, pretty manageable. Threes and four are going to be pretty manageable, pretty, uh, you know, pretty good candidates across the board for just about anybody. Uh, and then, obviously, we have the fives and the six, which now we're looking at lack of confidence or independence, right? Or the dog just completely wants to do his own thing. So these are also difficult dogs. So I would say the ones and the sixes are going to be your difficult dogs. The ones and the sixes are going to be the difficult dogs. Also, one last thing I want to mention about temperament tests is that temperament tests don't guarantee success. They don't guarantee that, you know, just because you get a bunch of ones or mostly ones, it doesn't mean that that's the type of dog you're going to have. There is environment. Uh, what I mean is training, lifestyle. All of those things are going to contribute to how well this dog is going to do. It doesn't mean that you just you see a bunch of ones and you should go, well, screw it, I don't want that dog. Certainly, if you don't have the experience don't get that dog or, you know, don't assign that dog to somebody who has very little experience. But just keep in mind that, that again, these are just markers, general markers that, that tell you, give you an idea of what the temperament is going to be like. There's also cases, and, and this happens all the time, where you get, you know, some ones, some threes, some fours, a six here and there, and then, like, your... your um, 
your temperament test ends up being kind of all over the place. So you go, well, crap, that's not black and white. What kind of puppy do I have here? What you do is you, instead of going, well, crap, I have, you know, one here and a two here and a four here and a six here and a, and a three here. What, what do I do? So there, it's all over the place. What I do is I look at the three as the, as the mid mark, as the mid range mark. So if it's three, if it's between one through threes, right? And I get a lot of between one through threes on the lower, on the lower number scale. That's one, two, or three. Uh, then I'm looking at it as it is more on the confident, on the bold side. If I'm predominantly getting, you know, a bunch of four, five, sixes, five, six, and then I'll get a couple of ones, you know, a two here and there. But the the tone of the temperament test is leaning towards the four, five, and six. Then I look at it as this is a dog that is either more on the timid side or more on the independent side. So that's what you do when your scores are all over the place. Instead of going, well, crap, I can't add it a lot because, you know, I got this, this, and that. Just look at, at the range. Am I getting a bunch of uh, low numbers or am I getting a, lo a bunch of high numbers? That's how you would determine this. And again, just remember, training does make a huge difference. This is just a temperament assessment. It gives you an idea of what kind of puppy you have. Training will guarantee the long-term success. All right, guys, to watch the rest of this episode and actually watch the puppies that I'm going to be testing, go to DrNingusMyPassion.com. Once you go there, you're going to get those tabs that will tell you to either work with me, purchase the Malino course, or do the virtual training. If you do the virtual training, that's a low monthly fee, which will give you access to exclusive content, this being one of the full episodes there. And this website, this membership area gets updated on a weekly basis. You can also find the rest of this video on the Malinois course. The Malinois course is a bunch of do's and don'ts on owning a Malinois or any sort of working dog for the purpose of protection training. So that's going to take you to this tab. I will cover in that course working breed tendencies, how to acquire puppies, equipment for protection work, and much more. So again, go to DutchTurningsFromPassion.com. See you guys on the other side.